there are a number of Confucian elements that drive how China thinks and acts in many ways. And one that you often hear about is guanxi or relationships. It's not that guanxi doesn't exist in other cultures. Our own relationships are important as well. But the Chinese concept of guanxi is very important. And what I often tell people when we start out is guanxi is uh, necessary but not sufficient in any relationship. So you will find potential Chinese partners that will try to sell themselves to you solely on uh, the merits of their own guanxi. It's called the I know a guy concept. And you shouldn't ever base a business decision on somebody that tells you that they know a senior official and that will be enough. Um, however, if you watch good Chinese business people, they work their guanxi networks like nobody's business. Uh, and so if you were to draw a picture as a Westerner of your guanxi network, it would involve a bunch of nodes and lines, but if you looked at the same version on the behalf of a Chinese business person, theirs would be like 10x yours. And as a result, people build that guanxi network building structure into their social lives, into their work lives. It often relates to who you studied with, who you work with, there are also family connections. And is very important to know is that it's not enough that we met five years ago and now we meet again. You need to really continue to strengthen the guanxi with particular people. So it takes a lot of time and effort. And one of the things that I have discovered is that we Westerners can never expect to be as good at it as our Chinese counterparts. And as a result, we need to think about what we can bring to a relationship that's truly unique. Is there some element of our Canadian nature, uh, the location we come from, something like that, that provides a unique element to the establishment of a relationship that your partner can't get from somewhere else. Uh, and this is some, one of the things that we have to do to try to make up for that guanxi deficit, so to speak. Uh, it's also the case that a Western or Canadian perspective on work-life balance will mean that we're not willing to spend our nights and weekends on things that may be related to work. Whereas in China, that's often very different and it's often different because it's done in service of building your guanxi. One of the mistakes people make is they'll come to China and they'll do a three-day trip, bam, 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 I set up my meetings and we're done. Whereas the building of guanxi often needs to happen in a fairly protracted way. So maybe you come for a trade show and you meet a company with which you have good synergies and you say, okay, well, I'm off tomorrow, but maybe we'll follow up in six months. If you've actually left yourself a bit of time and you say, you know what? I think we have a lot in common. Why don't we go out to lunch tomorrow? And you can use that time to take the relationship to a point where you can do more. This is also very important to keep in mind in negotiations because uh, the Chinese counterparts we're negotiating with know that we are often in a hurry and they have uh, much more patience. And so we have members that have told us that they successfully saved a deal that went south at the very end of negotiations because they, they left, but they didn't leave the country. They actually left for a different city and the counterparts chased them to that other city and brought them back and they finished negotiating on the terms they had agreed to. But if they had gotten on a plane and flew back to Canada, they never would have salvaged that deal. So building that sort of flexibility in is very important. There's another Confucian element called wrenching, which is essentially kindness. And it's the concept that you will put yourself out on behalf of others and you have an expectation that they do the same for you. And this is very much related to guanxi. But a Westerner coming in to do business often will not understand that they should be doing so much else on behalf of someone. It's more transactional. And we find this on um, cross-cultural teams where the Chinese members of a, of a team in a company may find the Western members of the team a bit cold and indifferent because maybe when those uh, colleagues traveled to China, the Chinese colleagues really went all out to make them feel good. And maybe they showed appreciation, but it didn't end up being reciprocated in the way that the Chinese side um, expected. And so I often find that on these cross-cultural teams, you will have team members that are really good indicators of wrenching 
And so having the Canadians understand that and at least be able to acknowledge sufficiently how much the other person did, that's important. They need to be prepared to do much more socializing for business purposes. And it may sometimes feel like business isn't getting done, but that may just be the precursor to business happening. And so the ability to understand the people you're doing business with and for them to understand you and to build trust is really important. So we will find business people that tell us, yeah, you have to go out and drink Mao Tai, for example. It's happening less and less. In fact, the popularity of wine makes it a bit easier as an anti-corruption campaign has taken root in China, there's less drinking of high value liquors and stuff like that. But it's not just going out and drinking, it's going to networking events, it's meeting somebody for lunch on a Saturday, and it's also doing things for people, and in exchange, they would expect you to do things for them. But the other thing to know about both Renqing and Guanxi is that if somebody extends you a favor or does something for you and you can't possibly reciprocate either because you don't have the means or because there might be ethical considerations in it, then you have to be careful not to accept that favor.